Hello everyone and welcome back to this series. In the last episode I said that we're going to start looking at the innards of the building and that's true, that's what we're going to be doing today. So it doesn't matter where we are, we can be Apache or model it, but I'm going to be heading up to this. This is the building template manager, we can get it from the access bar at the top. Just for reference, this is useful for when we're starting out because all the options have a bit more text around it but when we get a bit more familiar with these layouts then we'll probably move over to tabular btm which is exactly the same thing but in a more succinct fashion making working with it a little bit easier now from a previous win so the first thing is we're going to build on what we went over in I think it was video 11 or 12 it was actually video 10 looking at grouping these are going to be very handy for today's session so let's load up the building template manager and start explaining what we're seeing so it immediately jumps to the thermal this is the one that we're going to be dealing with today and for the purposes of these videos, as this is really designed for a beginner starting out on IS, we're going to ignore the voids, the plenums, and the SA plenums. This is the returner and supplier. But we'll touch on voids, I think, first, because they're worth the discussion in their own right. So a void within a building, at the moment, we're, I don't believe we have any in. No, we don't. But a void within a building is a space internal, so it takes up some of the internal volume of a building that doesn't have any heat gains associated with it. So the room is left to be free running. We can do this, we can assign this in IES, and I'll just give a quick example of we don't want this to be adjacent building. We certainly don't want the height to be 90 meters, but let's just say we have a 3.5 meter floor to floor plan and we have a simple building and inside the building there's a riser of some description rooms around it now this riser as it would be is it doesn't have any heat gain in it we don't really care what happens with it except we don't really want it to be in our energy balance as well Things like voids can be risers, they could be lift shafts. I would avoid putting in staircases because staircases, if particularly if they're on an external wall, can sometimes require frost protection. So we might be considerate of the, we might set a set point to 14 or 16 degrees within those spaces. And for very, very tall buildings, we might also care about the effects of heat gains on the topmost floor but for this we would just in order to make sure that this is set as a void let's go to properties and when it says object type sorry subtype I'm gonna hit void and what will happen immediately is we'll see that the yellow tile is now grayed out so that's all a void is okay returning back to the building template manager we're presented with this tab, this tab here. And what I want to do is, in this session, cover what this does. In the next session, we're going to have a, a larger discussion about profiles. So, at the moment, all of our rooms within the building are assigned this template. And we can make a new template, and we can also import templates. There is some disagreements within the larger modeling community about whether we should be importing templates each time or making up new ones specifically for every model. We won't go into that. I'm going to show you how to create one from scratch. If at a later point you decide, and I probably will cover this in a later video on how you import a template, but we're just going to keep it simple for the moment. So we can add a template we can see that one's come up here and typically we tend to follow the room group types that we set up earlier this is why this can be very useful 
So let's do, first of all, the kitchen. On our first, we have our system, which we haven't set up our systems yet. But our HVAC system is what's going to apply the heating to the space, or cooling, if it has cooling. So that would be our main system for the moment. We can set these to be the same as HVAC. If we don't have an auxiliary ventilation system, so a fan system supplying air, then we could set this to be none. The domestic hot water, so if it's the same as the boiler, then we would just say main system. But if you've got a different kind of system, e.g. if it's a direct electric, then we would set that system up for that. Or if it was, you had something like a, a heat pump, a water, an air source heat pump apply, supplying a cylinder that provide the hot water for a building, then we might model that. So we'll come back to these at a later stage. We also have this button here. We're gonna just stick with Apsis. App HVAC, which is Apache HVAC. We could spend an entire YouTube tutorial series going over the details of that program alone. But again, this is aimed at beginners, so we're just gonna stick with Apsis. Heating plant radiant fraction and cooling plant radiant fraction, as well as simulation heating unit capacity. So what this is, is how much of the heating that the emitter within the room is as a radiant fraction. For reference, if we have something like a radiator on a wall, then the radiant portion of that is going to be 60-40, uh, between 60% radiant, 40% convection. If we had something like a radiant panel, that's 100% radiant. If we had something like a fan core unit, that would be zero radiant because that's entirely convection. We can also, and this is more useful if we've got a very repeated design within a building, actually limit the capacity of the heating units. Where this can be very useful is if you've got something like a hotel and you know you're gonna have a certain type of fan core unit, say a 2.2 kilowatt Dakin unit or Mitsubishi unit within each room. You could set this as a 2.2 kilowatt unit and then you could effectively see or flag up which rooms don't meet the spec. That's more for advanced use. For the time being, we're just gonna keep it on and limited. This system outside supplier is a bit of a novel function. And I would again, avoid using this for the most part. It's off by default for reference. But if we want to supply air to a room, but want it to effectively avoid the air handling system, so this is direct from outside, then we can add that in here. And we can add it as liters per second or liters. We'll see in a minute when we go to air exchanges why we would probably avoid this one. But this can be handy if you're trying to accurately model, say, the energy effect of WCs. So where we might have, in the UK anyway, six liters per second per bathroom. I think at this point I should probably just mention that my background is building services engineering more towards the consultancy side. So if any of these figures are familiar to you, then great. If they're not, then I'm going to have to ask you to trust me. <laughs> Otherwise, you're more than welcome to look up the values within SIBZ Guide A or Part F for that one, or Part L we deal a lot with. Okay, so that's this tab. Next tab, we have the space conditions where we have the heating, domestic hot water, cooling, plant auxiliary. And then we have these settings down here that we're gonna discuss. So heating plant, what's this? Uh, well, we can set an operation profile for this. So we have two options. We can either set as constant or a profile or two value. In a constant operation, we're just giving values for when this boiler is coming on. When we talk more about profiles, this will make more sense. But effectively at the moment, we're saying that this boiler is active 24 hours a day. So depending on what value we put in here, it will try and achieve 
19 degrees at all times. Obviously, if it goes above that, then that's fine. You know, it will go above that, but it will never go below 19. And if we, and this can change, and we can set this so perhaps only the boiler was available for use during the early mornings, during the evenings, midday, whatever we want, we can set it to that. We have an option here to set this to a profile as well. So perhaps we want it to be at 19 degrees during the day with a setback temperature of 16 degrees during the times where we're not there. So we can achieve that through this. At the moment, there's no profile that does that, but we will make one. There's also this quite nifty two value where this is quite nice for offices as just a standard one, but we could effectively set our main temperature set point. So let's say we want to achieve 20 degrees and we have a setback of 16 degrees. And then you can see this is geared towards offices. So this then comes on at 6.30 in the morning. The boiler is available from 6.30 till 6.30 in the evening, so for 12 hours. Then after that point, the boiler is off. Well, not off, but it goes to the setback value. And at the setback value, it can achieve 16 degrees. There's also a narrow one there. So the whole profile is on 24 hours. The boiler is always available during that time. However, there's this setback point. So that's quite useful. For the moment, I'm gonna leave it as 19. Domestic hot water. This is a bit of an odd one. I'm not going to lie within IES. So this is useful predominantly in compliance modeling. And the reason why I say that is because it's very difficult to predict the domestic hot water use for a given room type without accurately modeling the faucets and the number of people. So what we typically tend to do in compliance modeling at least is we'll have a liters per meter squared for per type of unit whether that be an office space or whether that be a school classroom, we'll have this values for the amount of domestic hot water we would expect given that amount of floor area. Now, the reason why I say this is a bit quirky is under that view, we, we don't actually allow for domestic hot water consumption within WCs because WCs aren't occupied areas. It's more the floor print of the building generates the hot, hot water demand. By, by and large, we just leave this as zero. We're not necessarily interested in it. It's not really gonna affect how the thermal performance of our building is gonna work, so it's fine there. If we're doing more accurate model with CHP, then maybe we would use some empirical figures here. But for the moment, I'm gonna leave it as zero. Cooling, exactly the same as heating. Just as a word of advice though, obviously don't have your set point for your cooling below the 19 degrees because then the bill, say if I did this, it won't reach equilibrium. Because we've got an unlimited cooling capacity, which we set on here, trying to beat unlimited heating capacity. I'm actually gonna turn this off because it's a kitchen. So obviously we wouldn't have that. Auxiliary profile. This is for things like pumps and fans. That's fine to be left alone. And then we have solar model settings, solar reflected faction. Again, advanced settings. We don't really have to worry about this. This is the amount of solar sunlight that's gonna be reflected around the room. Sometimes known as, a, oh, I forget the term off the top of my head, but reflectance. And then your furniture mass factor is effectively the thermal massing of the furniture itself within the space. And this can, this can affect things, but again, we're not gonna worry about it. Humidity control. Well, there's a big statement here. 
but unless you're going to go into detail with dehumidification, which may be the case within, uh, say, Far East Asia, if you were doing design there, then we would be controlling for this. However, I would say if you're going to be doing that within the design, that's better suited to Apache HVAC rather than uh, this more simplified version. Just because I don't believe that it accurately models the dehumidification loads on the cooling coils. But we can set humidity control here at any rate. Okay, so on the next tab we have the internal gains and these, ne these next two tabs are gonna look pretty similar. The internal gains is where we can set out the expected amount of gains for a property. Well, not for a property, it's my bad, for a room. So if we load this up, we can see that we have two within the database already. We can add these to the templates by clicking on the side. None of those are particularly useful though. So I'm gonna add a gain, making sure it has a sensible name, kitchen lighting. And I'll set this to some LED lighting with a wattage per meter squared of say 10. And we can set other things here. There's many ways of calculating up the lux. A diversity factor, well, it wouldn't have a diversity factor because all the lights would probably be on at the same time. We're not concerned too much with these figures. We're not concerned. It's fine for everything just to go on the electricity meter for the time being, particularly within this project. Variation profile, fine, full. IES does have an ability to provide dimming, which can be useful for more accurate portrayal of office spaces. Again, that would be a subject for another video, which would deal directly with the specifics of lighting in more detail. For the moment, it's fine. The variation profile would be something where we set the hours of the use. So we could, if we wanted to, use say the office profile here. And the rest of it, I think we can we can ignore. And and there is so many settings within IES. There's so much potential. If you the general rule of thumb is if you don't know what something does, first of all, never press it on a live project. The second rule is if you are going to play around with something, it's best to only play about with one thing at a time. So on a separate save from the main project, just have a tweak with something or read up the manual on IESVE about what that thing is, get a little bit more information about it, try to understand a bit more, have a play with it, and then see how it goes. So what I want to do now is I want to add this, and we can see that that's been added in. We could add some other things, we could add some people. So if we add a people, uh, and for our kitchen, let's say we've for the sake of argument, let's say we've got a couple of people over for dinner and we want to see how much that's going to, how much heat they're going to gain. So we're going to go from meter squared per person. Very, very useful, incidentally, if we're using something like SIBSI guidance, table 6.2. We could go over to, say, people. We can actually put in the number of people. We've got six people over for dinner and we'll have them there through the day. So it's more of a lunch. Okay, add them in. We can see that's been added in. Maybe we've got a bit of cooking going on. We could add that in too. So that's the gains at its simplest. We then have the ear exchanges where we can add edit again and typically we're always going to have some sort of infiltration in our building now there is a rough rule of thumb 
for this. Um, if you're familiar with the UK scenario where we use a pressure test of 50, pa 50 pascals, the pressure test, then you'll know that it's air exchanges per hour. I've gotten that wrong. One second. Okay, so I just checked. It's in cubic meters per cubic meter uh, per meter squared, uh, fifty pascals. So that you're looking at a flow rate over the course of an entire building, at least in the UK for compliance. There is a rule of thumb though where we can that people tend to use where if you divide by 20 it gives you a rough estimate for the infiltration rate as an air changes per hour. So that's something handy to note. Uh, so depending on the building, we're going to have this go up or down depending on the age. For older buildings we expect this to be higher, for newer buildings we expect it to be lower, hopefully, fingers crossed. And as it's an infiltration, it's going to be on continuously. But let's add some extra infiltration on. We have quite a lot, sorry, extra ventilation on. Now we have a couple of options. We can set natural ventilation. This is really used, or it should be avoided. If you're going to be using natural ventilation here, then it's suggested that you follow guidance from something like AM10 and then use a spreadsheet to calculate out the expected air changes and then put it in here. But typically when we do natural ventilation modeling in IES, rather than giving a figure here, we can actually model the natural ventilation itself. The only time this might be used is within certain kinds of compliance modeling. So I'm going to remove that for the time being and add another air exchange. So we can add some auxiliary ventilation into the space. And we might call this, uh, let's say, kitchen supply and extract. And we can say we have options here for what we're doing in terms of supply. We can use an air exchange rate, we can use liters per second if we wanted, we could use liters per second per meter squared, not massively useful. This liters per second per person though can be particularly helpful because if we say add in 10 here and then we had it on continuously turn that on so we're about to turn this on what this should do is it should read off the amount of people that we have in the space and actually supply it respective to that amount. A word of caution when you do this is that if you have ramping profiles within your occupancy, then also the ventilation will be assumed to be demand driven. So if you imagine, and we'll show it in the next video, where we've got a profile that's you're modeling people to slowly trickle in between 8.30 and 9.30 in the morning, then what will happen is the ventilation will be matching that as opposed to just turning on fully. Now, it could be that we have demand side ventilation where we're using something like CO2 sensors in combination with inverter driven fans but then again, we might not be, and it might just be a fan that comes on a certain time in the morning. So just be wary of that note. Finally, if we were doing compliance modeling, in, these t in this tab, we would set what kind of building it is. And this is used so when the NCM, in the UK setting, which is the National Compliance Methodology, when we do the compliance model, when it builds a copy of the model itself to give a comparison, a baseline model, or sometimes known as the notional building. If you're not doing compliance modeling, you can just take a rest at this point. You don't have to listen. 
then it knows what kind of rooms to put in. Finally, this comfort tab, quite useful if we're doing more in-depth analysis of comfort within the space. So we can set the metabolic rate, for instance. We can set the clow rate. Uh, Sibsi gives some guidance on the kind of th activities within the room. I mean, we would expect someone, this kitchen environment might be moderate, a little bit of working. Clow values, we can all set that here. Air speeds, if we wanted to. Shortwave radiation, we can do all these. But for the most part, we're just going to leave all this as standard unless we're doing in depth comfort analysis. Certainly, this doesn't matter if we're doing heat gains and losses. So, I'm going to save that now, hit OK. And the next thing to do is to apply this to the kitchen. So, and in Apache, I hit save. In Apache, just like we did with constructions. I'm going to go down to, in this instance, I'm going to hit kitchen. I'm going to click on query in the top bar, which is the cube with the question mark. Sorry, apologies, not query at all. Assign, assign room thermal template, just to the right of assign room thermal template, just to the side of assign constructions. There we go. And then we can see that kitchen is turned up and we can apply it there. Now the advantage of the groups is it allows us to quickly select all of the same type because we've set it up to be that way. So if you imagine you have a big office block with, or you have hotels are pretty, I keep going back to hotels, but they're synonymous with IES modeling. You have, imagine you have a hundred rooms or 200 rooms within a hotel, then rather than arduously assigning templates, we can just click on the hotel room, assign it 200 rooms in one go and job's done. If we go to query now, kitchen query, we can see that that thermal template was loaded in. If we wanted to, at this point, we could do some extra stuff like model in ventilation rate from an extract hood using local mechanical exhaust. This can be quite useful for things like WCs and it can be useful for things like kitchens but given that this is a kitchen extract hood it's only going to be on for a couple of minutes every well half an hour every day maybe at most it's going to be minimal in terms of our energy balance we can see all the system settings in here and if we go to people now it should give us a total for the estimate amount of people within the space so we set it to six people it's saying that's going to be our gain and if we go to ear exchanges then we can see that that supply and extract has been put in at 60 liters per second, tracking the amount of people. Okay, so I'm briefly going to touch on now the tabular version of this. And we can see here, it's exactly the same thing, but now we can see all of these simultaneously. And if we wanted to, we could go through and we could set the system up this way. This is quite handy for if you've come to the end of your project or if you are familiar with the software, then you can come to this point uh, and just check a vast quantity of rooms in one go. And particularly the systems tabs, if you've got quite a few different types of AC units, then this can be particularly helpful in just configuring and changing the rows around and making little adjustments. So that's all we want to cover in this one. Thank you all for very listening. In the next one, what we're going to be doing is going more in depth into those profiles. And then hopefully after that, we should be ready to start pulling some analysis out, both in terms of SIBSI loads and Apache SIM. And we can start getting some more wonderful results out of our models. Thank you all very much for watching and I wish you all the best.